Good morning and welcome to Trinity Cathedral. Thank you for joining us for online worship this morning. Our preacher is none other than the Reverend Dr. John Luttrell, one of the associate clergy at Trinity Cathedral. We are glad that you're with us. Deacons Carol and Chris are with us also, Faye Manick. Thank you to Canon Steve Welch, some of you who may have been trying to get us on YouTube may have problems. We are not being able to connect this morning, but we are glad that you're with us and thanks for being part of us.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Keep, O Lord, your household, the church, in your steadfast faith and love, that through your grace we may proclaim your truth with boldness, and minister your justice with compassion for the sake of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, <clears throat> tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I have grown old and my husband is old, shall i have pleasure the lord said to abraham why did sarah laugh and say shall i indeed bear a child now that i am old is anything too wonderful for the lord at the set time i will return to you in due season and sarah shall have a son but sarah denied saying i did not laugh for she was afraid he said Oh, yes, you did laugh. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. 
Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight years old, eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Paul's letter to the church in Rome. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to his, this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, 
Rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, to Lord, you. Christ. Lord Christ. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, 
no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or, or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who is in it worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come unto it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Solomon and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me, as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time. father his child and children will rise against parents and have them put to death and you will be hated by all because of my name but the one who endures to the end will be saved when they persecute you in one town flee to the next for truly I tell you you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to Praise you, Lord Christ. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Good morning to everyone. I uh, want to present to you a sermon which I think is woven out of three or four different strands, but not all that different from each other. Um, and it comes from a lot of different sources, this sermon. Um, one of them is to recognize that we're all very deeply into this uh, lockdown at the moment about the pandemic. And I think probably at least a few of us are growing a little weary of this, although we all understand, I think, that it's necessary in order to control the virus itself and to keep it from spreading further. But um, Rosemary and I have been talking about this a little bit, and this uh, lockdown, as it's commonly called nowadays, I think also has some benefits. And we were talking the other day, Rosemary and I, about uh, ways in which people might be discovering things about themselves that they never knew before, things that are powerful and positive and things that are helpful, Th such things as um, uh, talents for artistic expression that they never knew they had. Uh, curiosities that they never recognized in themselves, uh, that they're beginning to follow up. Maybe uh, the ability to learn a new language or to learn something more about American history that they never knew. So those things, I think, also may be coming to pass among at least some people and maybe more than just some. But in the midst of all this, of course, the past three weeks, we have all been confronted with terrible tragedies um, news of, of tragic import. Um, and um, we're all trying to come to grips um, in possibly in ways that we never did even back in the 1960s. Uh, things that show us about the inherent racism that still lingers in our society and uh, bring home to us the fact that perhaps our war between the states of more than 150 years ago is not yet done. Um, now, in the midst of all this, I think we have these readings in a timely way. I sometimes, in, in my 50 years or so of uh, priesthood, I have sometimes been very frustrated by the lectionary 
because it seems as though you get to a certain Sunday and you wish that the lectionary said something more direct, uh, something more, uh, a little more comprehensible about some crisis that the nation is in or some local crisis that may be simply affecting your own parish, something of this kind. But lo and behold, the lectionary, I think, for today speaks to us in very timely ways. I'll just point out, for instance, in the epistle for today, where Paul says that endurance produces character and character produces hope. Well, I think we must all become very hopeful people, given the fact that we're enduring this lockdown and seeming not to do it too badly. Uh, so that's one thing about this lectionary, but I want to concentrate more uh, on the reading from Genesis, because I think it, it is very, very timely here. Um, these recent events in our nation are causing many of us to ask painful and probing questions about the church's witness to truth and justice. The collect today, I think, also prompts us to ask, uh, as it sets us a very high goal, it prompts us to ask, what is the truth that we're supposed to proclaim with boldness? And what is the justice that we are supposed to minister with compassion? Those, I think, are, are, are very, very good questions, and it's the lectionary that brings them right in front of us. Um, we might also ask ourselves, how can we move our fellow citizens to change their ways when those same fellow citizens could point fingers at our own practices within the church we profess to love? These are very important questions, and I'm not suggesting to you, I wouldn't dare suggest to you that the lectionary gives us easy answers to these questions. But I think we can find some hope for the boldness and compassion we will need in order to pursue some answers. The reading from Genesis today speaks to us of new life coming from the God of Israel in startling ways, never expected by Abraham or Sarah. I am personally feeling changes of this kind in my own life, now and ever since Rosemary and I began to attend the cathedral. In a previous sermon or two, I have mentioned the heavy weight of prejudice and division in the world I grew up in. Over, I think, a little more than a year ago, I mentioned something about having grown up in a town that had a sundown law. Now, for anyone who might possibly be unfamiliar with that term, I would simply say that a sundown law was crafted in a lot of towns uh, after Reconstruction in the South to describe uh, a, a restriction on people of color so that they may not stay in the town after sundown on any day. That with sundown, they all had to leave and get outside the city limits of that town. And I, my hometown was one of those for a long time. And the weight of that kind of prejudice um, simply weighed on me and everybody else who lived there for a very long time. I also would have to say that it was part of, that racism was simply part of the world I lived in and nobody seemed to be very conscious of it. It was part of the fabric, it was part of the air you breathed. I would say also, just to give a very small kind of a history lesson here, that the state of Oklahoma was established on actually two kinds of racism. Uh, but the most immediate one was not racism against people of color or African Americans. It was racism against what we might call Native Americans or the Canadians sometimes call indigenous peoples people who lived in the Oklahoma Territory before statehood and were brought there, a lot of them, by Andrew Jackson during his presidency in order to make room for more white settlement in the Deep South. Cherokees, Choctaws, Seminoles, Creeks, uh, and, and 
there were also Plains Indians living in the same space, and all these people were crowded together in this Indian territory, which then was open to white settlement by the federal government willy-nilly without any, any consulting with any native peoples. Uh, that whole area was open to white settlement in 1889. And people were invited to come and stake out 160 acres for each individual who made the land rush in April of 1889. Um, and a lot of those folks came from parts of the old Confederacy, Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, Missouri. And they brought attitudes with them that they had known uh, from their own childhood in the Deep South. So I remember in my childhood, when I was old, 10 or 11, uh, beginning to notice signs that particularly in Oklahoma City, that was back in the days when railroads were the, still the great means of transportation all across the country. And I can remember when I was 10 or 11, I went to the Santa Fe Railroad Station in Oklahoma City with my grandparents to meet a family member who was coming down from Kansas City on the train. And I remember noticing colored and white waiting rooms, colored and white water fountains, colored and white restrooms. And as I grew a little bit older, I began to notice all over the place, lunch counters and all sorts of common institutions that were part of the fabric of our civil society that were segregated. Um, there was de facto segregation, and there was that de jure segregation. Uh, schools, as, as I recall them, were not de jure segregated, but they were certainly de facto segregated. And some of that uh, in my high school and local schools of the town that I lived in, some of that segregation came from the old sundown law where people of color had to live outside the city limits. They could use the public schools in my town, but they had to be bussed in from those outlying districts and neighborhoods. Well, that's the kind of thing that I grew up in. And um, those, those really bad times will not seem strange or unfamiliar to a lot of you who are listening to me this morning but my own conscience of them has been raised by the balm of compassion I have felt since becoming acquainted with so many gifted people in the cathedral. The Genesis passage this morning shows a sad, disappointed Sarah and Abraham encountering strangers all unaware, strangers who have power that neither Abraham nor Sarah has ever dreamt of. These three strangers make it imperative for Abraham to display the one great gift that he would always give to any such people he would encounter in his nomadic tradition. This was the gift of generous hospitality. Abraham's not a wealthy man in this story, but he gives what he has. Bread, meat, and milk are life-saving resources to strange travelers who are bound across the desert. Abraham's compassion is then repaid in this story by none other than the God of Israel, who bestows on him and Sarah the ultimate gift they have longed for, a son and heir. For faithful people in their world, this is the gift of new life itself. By the way, this, this particular story about Abraham and Sarah is one of a whole category of stories in the Old Testament that are meant to illustrate the origins of names. The Hebrew word for laughter is the root of Isaac's name. In Hebrew, Isaac is Yitzchak, and the verb in Hebrew for laughter is tzachak. And uh, so it becomes Isaac's name, and it is, we're given to understand by the story itself, that Isaac was named Isaac, partly because it was Sarah who laughed in a kind of irony at the fact that she could deliver a child at her age. Sarah laughs for joy in spite of lingering doubts that this wondrous thing might happen. 
Now, what, I ask myself, am I supposed to make of this story? What are we, you and I, supposed to make of this story? I think, first of all, in the midst of the turmoil, the sadness, the heartache, the bitterness and the confusion we have seen and heard in our nation in the past three weeks, there is cause for hope nevertheless in this tale of Abraham and Sarah. Where new life seems impossible, God brings it anyway. Notice something else, however, that despite or perhaps because of their old age, Abraham and Sarah are prepared to receive this gift. Abraham's hospitality bears witness to their readiness. And the story, among other things, I think is a good reminder that gifts are sometimes as difficult to receive as they are to give. Extended families of Christians and we might use the same word in this sense of congregations, congregations, if you like, can constantly discover a new life if and when hospitality to strangers dwells at their heart. By the same token, newly arrived strangers can become children of light if they are really hungry for that hospitality. The compassion expressed in that hospitality can give birth to a new consciousness of justice, both racial and otherwise. When we learn to depend on God alone, as Abraham and Sarah did, we are ready, I think, to understand both truth and justice. In St. John's Gospel, the word truth occurs many, many times. In the 14th chapter of St. John, Jesus describes himself as the truth. And I think it's always good to remember that because of this, we can always think of Jesus as the most complete expression to a world in desperate need of God himself. If we can believe in Jesus, we can believe in God. It's also in John's gospel that Jesus says to Philip, if you have seen me, you have also seen God. However, we must also realize that learning to depend on God often takes a long time, even a lifetime. It seldom comes in the twinkling of an eye, and it can require patience. After all, in this story, look how long Sarah had waited when she finally brought forth a son for Abraham. She had waited a lifetime. There's another thing I think the lectionary brings to us that, that is worth uh, taking a closer look at. This is verse 13 of Psalm 116, which really seems to me at first blush problematic. And that is because verse, one six, verse 13, sorry, of Psalm 116 says, the Lord takes pleasure or, or in, the, in the death of a servant, or the Psalm says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of a servant. Now, we can understand death in at least several ways, I think but I would like to take this tack when examining this verse of Psalm 116. It seems to me that when we die to our old ways of error and are born to a new understanding, we are, as Paul says, a new creation. Therefore, we truly are precious in God's sight. This is, I believe, the story of my own life in these latter days, as day by day I have taken a new look at many things, especially in the past three weeks. My walk down this path has taken me at least 30 years, 
but given time enough, I could point to several events that have prepared me to be amazed and renewed by what I have found in the cathedral. Not the least of these is the love that has been shown me in the midst of my illness and the understanding of what I am going through. I am constantly surprised, delighted, and comforted by these expressions I have found so often in the people around me, people of color, people of my own appearance, all over the congregation. What then for me comes next? What comes next for all of us? I suspect for myself that my next challenge is to speak up, reach out, and lay claim to the new life that God has put in my lap. I am certainly not done with faults that still hinder me, nor am I done with racism, certainly not yet. But by his grace, God is not done with me either. And to this I say, Alleluia. Thank you. Thank you, John. Let us pause for a moment and hear those words that if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. We continue our worship with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things are made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, whom with the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic church. That, that we, we all, all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. 
that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Today we remember before God Magdalene Joy Ingham, Jimmy Elmer, for his parents, Michelle and James. I ask you to join me in giving thanks to God for Eastland John. I ask your prayers for Frederick Young. I ask your prayers for Eileen Nidwetsky. I ask your prayers for all those who are ill at this time, who have asked our prayers, who are in need of our prayers. We pray for those who have died, for Priscilla Lynn Stowe, for Jonathan Lewis Elliott, for Henry Hank Foster, for Marion Zazena, for Timothy Floyd. For those for whom we give thanks to God this day, for Susan Zasowski, Erica Warner, for Rosemary Luttrell, for Francis Boxdale celebrating birthdays for myself, your humble servant, for those celebrating anniversaries, for James, James and Lynn Palmer, for Andrea and myself as we celebrate our wedding anniversary as well. Lord, hear the prayers of your people and what we have asked faithfully granted we may obtain effectually to the glory of your name through jesus christ our lord amen 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 god of the present moment god who in jesus stills the storm and soothes the frantic heart bring hope and courage to all who wait or work in uncertainty bring hope that you will make them the equal of whatever lies ahead. Bring them courage to endure what cannot be avoided. For your will is help and wholeness. You are God and we need you. Mm. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. <clears throat> our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. A litany during the coronavirus pandemic. Jesus Christ, you traveled through towns and villages, curing every disease and illness. At your command, the sick were made well. Come to our aid now in the midst of the global spread of the coronavirus, that we may experience your healing love. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Heal those who are sick with the virus. May they regain their strength and health through quality medical care. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heal us from fear, which prevents nations from working together and neighbors from helping one another. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heal us from our pride, 
which can make us claim invulnerability to a disease that knows no borders. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Jesus Christ, healer of all, stay by our side in this time of uncertainty and sorrow. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with those who have died from the virus. May they be at rest with you in your eternal peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with the families of those who are sick or have died. As they worry and grieve, defend them from illness and despair. May they know your peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with the doctors, nurses, researchers, and all medical professionals who seek to heal and help those affected, as well as those who perform essential services to sustain our common life, and who put themselves at risk in the process. Be with those who have been exposed to the disease because of injustice. May they know your protection and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with the leaders of all nations. Give them the foresight to act with charity and true concern for the well-being of the people they are meant to serve. Give them the wisdom to invest in long-term solutions that will help prepare for, prepare for or prevent future outbreaks. May they know your peace as they work together to achieve it on earth. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Whether we are home or abroad, surrounded by many people suffering from this illness or only a few, Jesus Christ, stay with us as we endure and mourn, persist and prepare. In place of our anxiety, give us your peace. Jesus Christ, heal us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. peace of God. Just before I give the blessing, we want to again thank you for being with us. Thank you for supporting the ministries, the generosity of our congregation and friends of the cathedral helps to support so much of the ministry of the cathedral. 
So please keep your contributions coming in. Again, I want to mention that if anyone you know is in need and uh, we can be of service, please do get in touch with the cathedral uh, through calling or through our website and we will respond accordingly. Please join us also for fellowship, our virtual fellowship hour after service. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of the risen Christ. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia.